Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We welcome the visitors. We're looking forward to a good hour now coming up and we appreciate you being here and we appreciate you that's tuned in out in the radio listed audience. Now if you're listening out there and know of a friend that's a shut in and not able to be in God's house today, if you'll call them on the phone, have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour, I do believe we can be a blessing to them and I trust you'll do just that. I'm going to speak on the subject, the battle is the Lord's, and this will be tape 180. The message should be rich indeed because it's the Word of God, and you'll have the message and the music on cassette tape. Now, write in and get a list of our tape. I have 178 listed, I believe. I hope you write in and get a list of our cassette tape, or request them by number, or by title, and we'll get them to you. And there'll be a blessing to you. We we'll send them out for a gift of three dollars each. A gift is used to help defray the radio expense. You turn, will you please, to First Samuel's chapter 17. Heard someone telling the other day about a very tough man. He was unusually tough, and he figured he knew he was tough. And he's riding on a mowing machine, and something happened. And he fell off, and the thing ran over him and cut his nose off. He just got his old black tape out of the box there on the mowing machine, stuck his nose back on, taped it up, and went on about his business. Let the tape stay on for a period of time, and then he decided to take the tape off his nose. Didn't, and then he, when he did that, he saw he had the problem. He'd put his nose on upside down. Now, he didn't look any too good, but he had other problems as well. Every time it rained, it almost strangled him to death. And when he sneezed, he blew his head off. Now, outside of that, the old man made it pretty good. Now, you have a lot of tough people this day and time. I don't know whether it be that tough or not. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and reading one verse of Scripture, and I'll be referring to many verses here in this chapter. I want you to keep your Bible open at 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm reading from page 338 in my Bible. All this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Another verse of scripture in addition to that one is in Psalms chapter 108 and verse 13. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Now there's never been a time when there's so much sin so much evil in the land and so many people to practice sin and evil as in this day in which we live. The world situation is not getting better but getting worse. Now the Bible plainly tells us and warns us about that as we move toward the end that evil subduces to wax worse and worse and the world situation will get worse. Now you know when you have more people that are sinners you're going to have more sin practice on the earth. Someone said now about every other car that you meet on the highway, in a, on, on the average, every other car, somebody is either drinking beer, wine, or whiskey, or on dope. And so about it, every other car, you have a, a drinker, a doper in that automobile. And it's getting worse all the time. And that's why so many of our young people are slaughtering themselves on the highways, they're on dope, and on whiskey, beer, wine, or marijuana or something of that type and they're at themselves and they're committing suicide and killing each other on the highways shooting each other committing murder and it's getting worse all the time the other day i read where that uh, in our prisons now they're so filled with people until if you send us a man to prison you're going to have to let one out in order to have a place to put him in prison well our rotten criminal judicial system and the, uh, the American cranky lieutenant, uh, uh, li uh, lieutenant, not lieutenant, but uh, the lunatic is the word I'm trying to say. The American cranky lunatic union. Uh, they they out here trying to get all the criminals turned loose. And they have more sympathy for the uh, criminal than they have for the law-abiding citizen 
So this lunatic union today is out trying to do all they can to fill this land with evil. And so we need to realize that it's getting worse all the time. And then you have the crooked appeal court judges and you have many crooked lawyers that are out turning criminals loose with no sympathy toward the innocent victim that's been slaughtered or his family. And so you have these problems in the land today and they're getting worse all the time. Now, I know some of you say, Preach Edwards, I've heard you mention that many times. I know you have, but it bothers me. And you let some of your precious children get killed by these criminals, and, and then uh, you'll realize what I'm talking about. Uh, because the people today don't have any sympathy toward uh, you or your family if your daughter or wife or children get killed. They have a lot of sympathy toward the man that commits a crime, but not your family. And that's not right, and that disturbs me. And that's why that we need to keep making mention of it, because if something's not done about it, it's going to be real dangerous in the future to even get out of your house. Just about everybody have to arm themselves in order to even go to town and back in days that lie ahead. If something is not done about this uh, judicial system we have today in the land, the criminal judicial system, and kept in there and pampered and looked after by the taxpayers' money. And they should have been put to death immediately after they were tried. But our judicial system is so rotten and stinks so badly. Until many of us have been there seven, eight, nine and years or longer on death row. Now, if they would clean off death row and go ahead and do what God said do. Put these wicked criminals to death that's committed cold-blooded murder. And then when everybody commits cold-blooded murder, go ahead and try them and put them to death. Then you'd have room in the prisons to put these other less um, crimes that are committed. But see, our system is rotten and it stinks. And I'll tell you, beloved, it's, it's bad and something ought to be done about it. But we don't have anybody in authority that has backbone enough to get anything done about it. could do something about it. But something needs to be done about it. And so we need to be concerned about that. Now the battle is the Lord's and we are fighting a battle today like we have never fought before. That's never been a time when God's people and when our young people are facing the temptations and the problems that's confronting them today like it is in this hour in which would have never been a time like it before. Now you may say, Preach Edwards has always been sin. Yes, but there's never been as many people and there's never been as many ways and as many ways of temptation and so much worldly pleasure as you have today in the land to entice our young people and lead them astray and to tempt the adults and so forth. There's never been a time like this. And I'm not a pessimist. I'm warning you. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And you that have young people, my heart goes out to you. You have a real problem on your hands. Because there's so many young people running wild and the parents don't care because they themselves are out in sin. Uh, so they won't do anything about their children and your children have to go to school with them, associate with them. And your children can't understand why they can't be allowed that liberty for themselves. And the parents that know what's wrong and know it is wrong, uh, of course, they can't afford to let their children engage in it. And their children can't understand it and they want to quarrel with their parents about it when their parents know what the score is and know better and it's for the good of the child. It's not that the parents are not concerned about their children enjoying the good things of life and being able to associate with others and have the things that they need and like others have that are right. It's not that. They want them to have that. But at the same time, they want their children brought up right and want them to do the right thing. And we have so much trouble today in our high schools and in our colleges and universities until it's, it's pathetic and getting worse all the time. And so you people, you parents that have young people, you have our sympathy, you have a real battle on your hands and then for your grandchildren coming along, God only knows what they're going to have to face unless there's a change in this nation and in the world. And I'm not looking for much of a change until Jesus comes. And when he comes, he'll lift out the church and the wrath of God will take here all the weakness upon the earth. 
But you parents need to know and realize this and don't become discouraged when your children begin to uh, become a little bit querulous and they don't want to uh, mind you and don't want to do um, uh, things that they should do and want to quarrel and say others are doing otherwise. And that's going to work on your patience. But you need to be patient and try to do the best you can and be much in prayer. And therefore God can help you and God can do some things that you cannot even do yourself. And so it's a problem. And when you do the best you can for your children, in spite of all of that, there's many things that's not going right and will not go right. They will not be perfect. They will make mistakes. They will do things that will break your heart. But when you have done and done your best, then that's all you can do. And just look to God to take care of the rest. The battle is on. The devil is out after our youth today. The devil is out after the Christians today. And there's never been a time whenever Christians have had to fight the battle and the temptations and discouragement that they have to fight in this hour in which we live. I've been saved more than 40 years. I know what I'm talking about. I've been in the battle. I've fought hell with acres for more than 40 years. And it's rough today. And there's a battle out there raging. And we're in the battle. And we've got to keep on keeping on. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we take a look at something here. I don't know whether I'll be able to finish the message today or not. But it's such a, a good message as far as the Word of God is concerned. Not simply because I'm preaching it, but because it's God's Word that this message might have to be uh, finished on next Sunday morning. But the battle is on, the battle is raging, and the battle is the Lord's. Now I promise you on the authority of God's holy word that God will help you to endure the battle, to overcome the evil, to overcome the devil. He can do it. I remember the story one time of a little boy. He was a little red-headed, freckle-faced boy and cockeyed. That is, he look up with one eye and look down with the other. He was a type little fellow that could go squirrel hunting and rabbit hunting both at the same time. And he had never been to Sunday school. And that's no reflection on red hair and freckle faces. I think they're cute myself. I wouldn't mind having a little dozen little boys red hair and freckle face myself. But anyway, a little girl's either as far as that. But anyway, uh, he was a tough little fellow. And he knew he was tough. And he was the, the tough kid that lived across the way and everybody knew it and they finally round him up and got him into Sunday school one Sunday and he came in and sat on the back row and the teacher got up and he talked about the devil the lesson was on the devil and they talked about the devil during the entire Sunday school class during the Sunday school period and uh, as they talked about the devil he listened he sat there he looked down at the floor with one eye and looked up at the teacher with the other eye but he listened he used both his ears. He listened well. And then when they finished the lesson, the teacher said, Now, I wonder, boys, do you have any comment about what I said today about the devil? They said, Yes, sir, we have some comments. One of them said, I'll tell you right now, I hate the devil more now than I did when you started teaching this class. Another one stood up and said, Sir, I'll tell you, the devil is mean. I hate him and I just don't like him. and I'm not going to let him do much with me. And on and on they went. Just about all of them stood up and said a word or two, except the little red-headed, freckle-faced boy in the back row, the little stranger there. And then the teacher said, young man, the visitor here, we'd glad to have you, son, said, uh, said, would you stand up and say a word about what was said today about the devil? He stood up. He said, yes, sir. He said, I'll tell you right now. He said, I might not be able to handle a big devil like you. But said, you give me a little devil about my size and I'll take him on. And so a lot of times people get the idea that they can handle one about their size. But I want to tell you today, you can't handle the devil by yourself. You've got to have the Lord. You've got to have the power of God. And you're going to face the enemy on your job, in your neighborhood, in your home, or in your church, or wherever you go. You're going to face the enemy. He's going to be trailing around, and you're going to find him just about anywhere. And there's never been anyone any more religious than the devil. That's his field. The devil works in the religious field. And through God, we can do valiantly. God gives power to help us to overcome the wicked one. And by his help, God's help alone can we do it. Now, don't think you can handle him. Now, the devil 
may wall you around, but he can't cover you over. You can always go up to God about the matter, and God can bring the wall down. And so just remember, God is on your side. And when you go in on your job tomorrow, and that boss man looks kind of cross-eyed at you, and you know you're in for it for the day, or somebody on your job that's rubbed you the wrong way, or somebody that's left you depressed, or somebody that's mistreated you, and you know you're going to have to face the devil all day long, you need to realize this. God says, I'm on your side, and I'll give you wisdom and grace and strength, and I'll help you to overcome your problem. And God will be with you throughout that day, and he promised to do so. Now, the devil is on the job. He never sleeps. He works day and night. While you're sleeping, he's figuring out how to handle you the next day. And so the devil is real busy, and there's a real devil. Now, whether you believe it or not, there's a real devil. There's only one thing you'd have to look at in the world today to know without a doubt there's a devil, and that's the religious mess in the world today. The entire world is in a mess of religion. Now, when I say religion, I'm not talking about true Christianity. I'm talking about religion. Those Muslims yonder in Lebanon, they're fighting unto death for religious causes. They have been taught if they kill their enemy, that they'll get a reward in heaven. And they don't even know God. They're not even saved. And yet they're fanatical. And those Muslims over there, they are fighting a religious war. And they're fanatical. They're not saved people. These religious wars, the dirtiest, most bloodiest wars ever fought on the earth, you find to be religious wars. The devil is a religious person. And if he can get you ensnared in religion, then he's pretty well captured you. And that's why you have so much religion in the world today. That's without God. All of these cults that tramp around with their literature and false doctrine, they're of the devil. They're putting out their false literature and trying to get you tied up in their religion. And then if Satan can get you into a dead church where the gospel is not honored and preached and a little social gospel and entertainment taking place all the time, he'd like to have you there. He'll let you come and you'll sit there and listen to a social gospel and be entertained right straight into hell. And the devil's fall that 100%. Now we need to realize the devil is cunning, he's subtle. He's been on the job 6,000 years. He knows all the tricks of the trade. And you can't outwit him only through the word of God and by uh, God's help, God's strength and power. The battle is the Lord. You've got to have God to help you. A lot of people take a beating every day because they don't ask God to help them. You must have the Lord to help you as a Christian. God promised to do so and God said that he would help you. And God is obligated to help you. And you must have the help of the Lord or you're going to have a rough road to hold. But if God is with you, and he will be with you as a Christian, and it's not going to get any easier, there's greater battles to be fought further on down the road. Now you may say, now preacher Edwards, I've fought some pretty tough battles uh, since I've been saved. Yes, but you got some high hills to climb, my brother. You got some steeper hills to go up. You got some deeper valleys to go through, terrain more rugged. You got all that facing you out there. And I'm not a pessimist, I'm not trying to discourage you, but if you'll be a good soldier, keep your head up and move forward and look to God, greater be your reward when you come to the end of life's journey. These things you gotta face. And the older you become, these old bodies begin to ache with pain. You can't rest well at night. Can't do, get about hard in the daytime. And you have pain in your body and the devil will take advantage of that and almost beat you to death. You might say, well, when I get old, then all these lustful temptations I have as a young person, a young man, a woman, I won't have them to be bothered with when I get old. You might not have some of those, but you're going to have some more that's added to those temptations, like the suffering in your body and the problems and the trips you're going to have to take to the drugstore and the doctor and, and try to sleep at night and can't sleep for aches and pains and, and grunting and groaning all the time. you got those battles to face. And it's not going to get any easier. That's why I'm telling you, be prepared for the battle. God will help you and you fight right on to the end. Don't give up. Don't let up. And say, by the grace of God, I'm going to fight the battle and God will help me. Now we find here in this chapter uh, that I read the text from, I'm only going to touch on it and we'll finish it to the Lord willing next Sunday. We find a battle 
at a stalemate. We find on one hill the army of the Israelites. We find on another hill the army of the Philistines. Down between them is a valley and a little stream of water. And there they are looking at one another. And on the side of the hill where the Philistines are, there's a huge giant. And he's pacing back and forth. His name is Goliath. And he's pacing back and forth and he's cursing the Israelites. He's calling them all kind of names. He's cursing their God, Jehovah. And they're afraid to charge him. Old King Saul is the king of Israel. He was head and shoulder above the average man. He was a tall person. And he should have been out there, the main man to challenge Goliath. But he was back there in the palace. He was afraid to go out there. And then all those soldiers there in the army of the Israelites, they were afraid and old Goliath, he cursed and cursed and blasphemed the name of God. And he was out there rowing and carrying on. And uh, we find a Goliath is a type of the devil. The Bible said he was part of the saints that the spies said that Egypt inhabits the land. While he looks as strong and his people looks as strong until the, the spies, when they came back and made the report to Moses and Joshua, they said there's some giants so that just eat the people up. They eat up the inhabitants of the land. They're so strong and mean. Joshua and Caleb said, well, we'll take care of them. And the other ten said, we'll never do it. And they died in the wilderness. And Joshua and Caleb went over and, of course, took care of them. And there's some terrible giants over there. And the Bible said in verse 33 that this giant Goliath was a man of war from his youth. From just a little child, he had been trained to fight. He had been trained as a soldier. He had been given all the tricks and the strategy of warfare from just a little child. Now, a lot of nations have done that for their youth, train them from just a little child. And so he knew, he knew the strategy of warfare, and he was seeking to bring into captivity those that bear the name of the Lord. He wasn't concerned about the, the Amalekites or the Egyptians or some other group. He was concerned about the Israelites. They bear the name of God. And he said, I want to bring into captivity the Israelites. The Philistines and the Israelites had war with each other for years and years. They were bitter enemies. The Philistines, a type of the world and the devil, and the Israelites, of course, God's people. And he wanted to capture the people of God. That's exactly what the devil is trying to do today. He wants to capture the people of God. If he can capture you and rob you and discourage you and cause you to throw up your hands and quit or uh, get you to sit at home and not go to church or get you to stop praying or reading you about, he's got you. The devil has got you. The devil is the one that's got you. He's captured you and he's holding on to you. Now you'll have to be willing to break out of his grasp and then ask God to help you and get back in the harness for God. The devil has captured you. That's what he wanted to do and that's what he did. And he wanted to bring into captivity here the people of God. And he defied the army of Israel for 40 long days. He walked up and down that mountainside and 40 days he ran back and he cursed, he blasphemed the army of God. And for 40 days, every day, he pressed back and forth. He had those Israelis scared half to death. They wouldn't, they wouldn't dare to go out and attack that man. That huge giant, no, no. And for 40 days, he did that. Now, that's a beautiful type. That's a type of the 40 centuries from Adam until Christ. The 40 centuries here, the 40 days is a type of the 40 centuries from Adam to Christ until the greater David. The Lord Jesus Christ came on the scene and took care of Goliath. We'll say more about that, the Lord willing, next Sunday. Because we find our little David goes to the battlefront to take Goliath on. And we'll see more about that. In verse 16, the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. That is the Philistian. And he was a type of the coming Antichrist. Old Goliath that challenged and paced back and forth and roared. He's a type of the devil and he's a type of the Antichrist. He was six cubits high. His spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. And he had six toes and fingers on each foot and hand. According to 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 6 through 8, there he had uh, the number 6 marked all over him. And the Bible said the mark of the beast is 666. Six, six. All over Goliath you find the number 6. 
And so he was a type of the coming Antichrist. And then according to the Bible, little David went on the scene and he downed this giant with a stone. Just a little small stone he took out of the brook. The Lord willing, next Sunday morning, we'll go into that in detail. And there he took that little uh, a small stone out of that brook. And there he downed Goliath. Down with that big old giant that had been defying the army of the living God. Now that's a type of the stone that's cut out without hands. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34, that's going to down the Gentile world system, which will be headed up by the Antichrist when Jesus comes the second time down to the earth. All of this is a beautiful type. You ought to study it out. It'd be a blessing to you. Because there's coming a stone, like the stone of David's little stone in his slingshot, that down Goliath, this stone is coming, and it's going to come from heaven, a stone cut out without hands, it's going to down the Antichrist, break down the entire world uh, Gentile system that has beginning back in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And all of that will be crushed to the ground. And the stone that's cut out without hands is going to fill the earth. Now that stone is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's coming back to fill the earth at the end of the tribulation period. Now little David here, he's number eight in Jesse's family. Jesse had eight boys, eight children. And so little David is number eight. He's the uh, baby in the family, little ruddy complexion feller uh, with a ruddy complexion and maybe kind of ready sandy hair. He might have had a few freckles on his face, kind of a baby face type boy. And he's a good little old shepherd. And he loved the sheep and he kept the sheep for his father Jesse. And so David then is the young boy that comes on the scene. He's a type of Jesus in many ways, in many respects. David had already been there in the house of King Saul, there in the palace, and spent some time there. And when the evil spirit came up on Saul, he'd play on his heart and drive the evil spirit away. But he had gone back to Jesse's house, his father's house. The war was on. And then he had two brothers, his two oldest brothers, to leave home and go into the army and they were there with the Israelites part of that army that was challenged by Goliath now little David was back at his father's house and all during the 40 days that Goliath trampled to and fro on that mountain roared like a lion cussed the army of God little David was in his father's house for those 40 days that's a type of the greater David the Lord Jesus Christ that was in the father's house from the beginning right on down till he came born of a virgin the greater David to take care of Goliath on the cross that will explain in detail the Lord willing next Sunday but the 40 days in the father's house you find to be a type of the 40 centuries the 4,000 years from Adam unto Christ now God was getting ready to provide himself a leader God provides a leader or his need for any occasion he provided himself a lamb. You know, Abraham, when he's offering up Isaac on Mount Moriah, God, Abraham said, well, where's the lamb? And God said, I provide myself a lamb. And that lamb was the Lord Jesus Christ. God provided a lamb for himself, a sacrificial lamb. And so David, from a little shepherd boy, there watching over the sheep, taking good training, being very much concerned, faithful over a few things, his father called him in and said, Son, I want you to get your cart ready, and we're going to send you to the battlefront. I want you to go down and see how your two brothers are doing, see how they're faring on the battlefront. And then he said, I want you to check with the captains, and I want you to take them some cheese and bread and raisins and other food. I want you to carry it down there to them. And I want you to go and check on the situation, and let me know how everything's coming along. So little David's responsibility then was to take uh, some food down to the battlefield and see how everything was going down there. But he had those little sheep to look after. He loved his father's little lambs and the little sheep and the little goats. And you know what David did? He found the best person he could find and trusted him, one that would love those sheep, Love those little lambs 
protect those little lambs. David said, I want you to watch after daddy's flock while I'm gone. Don't let this thing happen to him now. You watch after him while I'm gone. He made a good little shepherd lad. God was providing himself a king to be the great shepherd of Israel in the future. And David became that great king. One of the most fascinating scenes in the land of Israel today is the Hotel King David. You can see that beautiful neon sign from miles away, King David Hotel, over in the middle of Jerusalem. That's where the dignitaries go when they go over there. Most beautiful indeed, but when you see those huge letters, big letters, King David Hotel, it'll make the hair rise on your head. This little old shepherd boy was faithful over a few things and God made him ruler over the nation of Israel. And he became the greatest king that ever lived. And the Lord willing, next Sunday morning, we're going to move on into the scene. We'll find out what David did to take care of Goliath. We'll find out the outcome and it'll help every one of us. But one thing I want you to remember as you go forward and face the enemy in the temptations, the battle is the Lord's. All you need to do is look to God and ask his help. And on the authority of God's word, I'll guarantee you, God will help you in your time of need. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father, we thank thee for the word of God. A lamp on thy feet and a light on thy pathway. Thank you, Father. The battle is the Lord's. And we're so glad that we can look to thee and overcome the enemy. And we know the enemy knows his time is short. The devil knows he doesn't have much longer to do damage. And he's working. He's on the double today. Doing everything he can to hinder God's people. To keep people from being saved. And to corrupt the nation and the world. We pray you'll give your people grace and strength in Christ's name. Amen. Now David's going to play for us. If you're in this building and you're not saved today or you're backslidden off any reason that you want to come forward, I want you to do so. Last week in our meeting over in South Carolina, we saw several come to the altar as God spoke to their hearts. And if God is speaking to you today about coming forward, about joining the church, or coming back to God, or whatever, getting saved or whatever, God may be speaking to you about, would you come while we wait? You and you alone know whether or not God is speaking to your heart. Would you come? Amen. God bless you, sister. Mistaken came, she wanted to rededicate her life to God. We use the Lord and bless them, God. Is there another? Why we wait just a moment? <laughs> 